Absolutely. I'm happy to be here and really looking forward to talking with you all. Um, there will be a lot of time at the end of my presentations for questions, so feel free to write in questions. And we'll start the slides now. Um, I'm a neuropsychologist at Virginia Commonwealth University. And today I'm going to be sharing with you about emotional support and self-care. And the things that I shared today um, are for people with the disorders that we're going to talk about, but are also very applicable to caregivers and family members as well. So I don't have any disclosures to make. And today um, what I want to do is briefly describe common thinking and mood changes that can occur in PSP, MSA, and CBD, but really spend a lot of time reviewing everyday activities that increase can improve emotional health and self-care. And so we're talking about um, progressive supranuclear palsy, multiple, multiple system atrophy, and cortical basal degeneration, but I'll use these abbreviations. And we can all relate that 2020 was very challenging and brought a lot of stress to our lives in different ways. And um, the strategies that I'm gonna talk about today can help with everyday chronic stressors, but as well as some of the more recent ones we've all had to experience. So an important thing about these disorders is that the age of onset is typically in the 60s or even mid 50s for MSA. And as a result, people are usually still working. They may be at the height of their career and considering retiring, making travel plans. And so there really isn't this mindset of I may be coming down with a medical illness um, with progressive changes. And spouses also may or may not be able to kind of quickly shift to new caregiving responsibilities. Another thing that you're all familiar with is that these are rare disorders. So often there's difficulty obtaining an accurate diagnosis. There's unfamiliar, unfamiliarity about what to expect and prognosis. And, um, Relatively speaking, in neurology, these disorders have more um, progression that goes on compared to things that take many, many years to develop. Um, but it results in ongoing changes with everyday skills and functions. And so you can kind of feel like there's a stress to that, to where you're adapting to continual changes. Just as a comparison, um, these disorders are characterized by changes in the brain that are called frontal subcortical. And I'm gonna explain that more in a moment. And that's quite in contrast to how um, Alzheimer's disease typically starts in the temporal lobes or on the sides of the brain. And you can see in this slide, the left side is a healthy slice of a brain. It's as if we just took a slice right through the middle of the brain. And on the right is someone with Alzheimer's. And you can see how down um, in the bottom parts on both sides, there's a lot of cellular loss. So it's not full and plump looking, it's all shriveled looking. And there's bigger holes, if you can see on each side down at the bottom, um, where the cell loss produces more um, larger holes that fill with fluid. But Alzheimer's starts there bilaterally in the hippocampi. Um, whereas um, frontal subcortical dysfunction is quite different. So it starts um, in the deep center of the brain. If you can see the, the pink and yellow um, circles in the middle of the brain, this is a slice taken through the brain as if we're looking through the side of a person. And the front where the eyes are would be to the left. But the deep center is called subcortical, sub meaning below the cortex. And it radiates, it has lots of connections to the frontal lobe, which is behind our forehead and is where both of those darker purple or blue circles are, but it's a huge area that's the frontal lobe. These um, tracks, I always tell people to think of like telephone wires. It's like you have tons of tracks between these two areas. So it's not like one band, it's lots of tracks and you can have lots of different symptoms. But this area of the brain and these tracks manage physical speed, which is something obvious we can see some slowing, but also mental processing speed, attention, working memory, which is kind of, can you keep something online in your brain, like recalling a telephone number long enough to dial it, 
executive functions is a term we use in our field for more complicated problem solving, reasoning and strategizing. And then retrieval based memories. And I'm going to explain that in more detail, but it's a certain type of memory disorder that's a little different from Alzheimer's. There also can be visual spatial impairments that we're going to talk about. So while there's some commonalities among the disorders, there are some specific uniquenesses um, from a neuropsychological perspective. Uh, we don't have to go into those in detail, but PSP is often associated with early, very prominent executive dysfunction. And so the slides that I talk about that are referring more to those problems would be particularly relevant. MSA has more of a, a variety of impairments across all those areas. Um, similar in some ways to Parkinson's disease. And cortical basal degeneration can present with more language-based issues initially. But these would all be characterized as having more of a frontal subcortical profile. Um, so this slide, I put that filing cart on there to kind of visually describe what I mean by uh, retrieval-based memories. So in Alzheimer's, it's like the cell dies, and so the memory is not there, it's just gone. In these disorders with frontal subcortical dysfunction, it's almost like the files in the filing cart got shifted around and you can't put your finger on the one that you want. It is in there, but it's not easy to access. So it's just as frustrating as someone with Alzheimer's struggling to remember something, but in this situation, cues and more time to think about it can actually help you usually pull out the information from your mind. Some other everyday kind of complaints, um, in addition to memory issues, being slower to do things, being distractible, difficulty multitasking, being forgetful, trouble with multi-step complex tasks, and trouble with more complex visual tasks. It is important for me to also note that there's many factors that can affect your cognitive functioning. And when you see a neuropsychologist, they would be looking at all of these as well because many things are very treatable and we don't wanna leave those untreated. Um, mood issues is a major area, so that can include stress, depression, anxiety, apathy, and even reaction or adjustment to the illness. Sleep problems, which can result primarily more in attention and memory issues. Um, fatigue, pain, appetite, nutrition, and even medication side effects can produce cognitive changes. Anticholinergic medications are typically avoided in a lot of neurodegenerative diseases because they actually can cause more memory problems. Um, sometimes you do need to take one and there's nothing else as an alternative, but that's something important to talk with your doctors about. So just to go over briefly some mood changes that can happen, there's lots of different ones, but as you see kind of bolded, depression and apathy are very common across these disorders. Apathy is typically a symptom of depression, but it's actually um, seen separately in Parkinson's and other disorders at times. And so apathy is more that lack of initiation and motivation and drive to do things. And you can have that with or without a depressed mood or sad mood. Um, but you see the rates here are around 40, 50, 60, 70%. Um, some less common things, but that, that do happen are more agitation, irritability. Disinhibition is where you don't really have like a break or you might... Um, um, like curse or do certain things that you wouldn't normally do, and anxiety is, can also be present. There are many functions to the frontal lobe, so we have a lot of cognitive areas that it manages, but behaviorally, um, the frontal lobe is like our brakes and our sequencing and problem solving. So people can um, be apathetic where they don't want to do anything, but we can also see that disinhibition where they might say things that wouldn't be appropriate or they wouldn't normally say. They can also be what we call perseverative, which means they kind of get focused on something and struggle to get off. And they can get focused on st a stimuli and not be able to shift as easily as well. There can be some neurovegetative symptoms. We won't go into those in detail today, but can be more sleep problems, nighttime behaviors, and even appetite or eating problems. 
So I want to spend a lot of the time today to talk about what you can do every day to kind of manage cognitive and mood changes that can come up um, and develop in a way like what I think of as your toolbox. What can you use to help yourself with things that are happening? Um, your tools may change um, over time, very individual to your needs, and it takes a little trial and error to find out what works for you. And you may use different tools at different times. So I want you to keep those things in mind as we review strategies. I always tell people um, for cognitive issues, which we'll cover first, it's good to use compensatory tools or aids to help you. And the earlier, the better, because you get then used to using it so you don't have to remember to use that thing. So it doesn't become another burden. Um, but using a calendar, if you've gotten out of habit, is very important. Um, using pill boxes, they're a great way to be able to check if you took a medicine. We, something we do every day, like taking pills, you're not gonna have a unique memory for. So if you take it and don't know if you've taken it, if you take it out of the container, you really have no way of knowing if you've done it or not. Um, people use alarms on their phones or even clip on alarms um, to remind them to take pills, especially midday. Um, and use the environment to help cue you. So if you put the calendar where you normally sit, that'll help cue you to be looking at it. Um, that um, little collection tray in the middle, I put as like a reminder for what I call like a landing pad where you put your keys, your glasses, your phone, and things that you need so that if you always try to get in the habit of putting them there, you'll have less searching for where they are when you need them. We know from research for memory that using a, a journal is, um, a calendar is very helpful. And you can see here the calendar that they studied at Mayo Clinic had a point quite, and down below they had a to-do list. But then on the right side, they had a journaling section. And you may have to look for a, a calendar with all this type of information in it, but we find that people who take notes and journal about what they want to try to remember really helps them, first of all, decide what they want to remember and they're encoding that, but then also they have a record of it to review and it gets processed more than just everyday occurrences. So um, using a journal and calendar system can be very helpful to help you be cueing yourself what you want to remember more of. And we know from research that checking it at least three times a day is good to catch things so you don't forget about an appointment or something like that. As people um, have more visual trouble with large um, content visually in front of them, it's good to get single day or week views so that you're not overwhelmed with the month view. You can still have that month view um, usually at the front of the calendar, but not use it for everyday things because it's a lot of visual material for some people to process. So multitasking is something none of us do particularly well. We just like to think we do. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna tell you that trying to avoid distractions and multitasking help all of us. Clearing your workspace of other distractions, um, doing things that are difficult at your best time, taking frequent breaks like every 20 minutes to refocus, helps your attention. Rechecking your work later for errors or having a partner check it can be helpful. And then definitely trying to make sure your sleep and exercise um, are helping you because those are both good for your brain health, but also um, consolidation of memories while you sleep and to treat any mood symptoms, pain or sleep conditions as we talked about because they can negatively impact your everyday functioning. With problem solving, that's a hard area to help people with, but I think it's important to allow yourself more time to make decisions, to think about options and even talk with other people because you may not be able to see different options and try to avoid rushing. Um, impulsive, impulsiveness can lead to some issues at times and planning ahead. So like if you know you're gonna be um, preparing to go visit somebody, you would spend more time getting ready for packing and allowing yourself um, time to collect everything you need so that you wouldn't feel rushed and miss things. So eventually in these disorders, people need more and more help uh, with activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. Activities of daily living are things like bathing, dressing, 
uh, meal preparation, management of finances and pills, calendars and appointments and driving. Um, and in my clinic, I always tell people um, key areas where people often need help earlier are things like medication and finances. These are two areas that are really important to look at because small errors in these areas um, can really make large mistakes and large problems to fix. So um, those are two areas that I think having two pa pairs of eyes on it can really be helpful. Um, and also I say tasks that take a long time. Sometimes I meet patients and they've talked about how it's now taking them hours or days to finish something like organizing their pillbox. And then at that point, it's probably more stressful than helpful. And if they have um, a caregiver or partner who can do that, that would be great. And then they can use that time to do more constructive things that are helping their brain health, but are not that stressful. I also put the word on here about scams because financially, um, there's a lot of scams that are going on right now, and it can be hard for anyone to detect them. But I think when your executive skills are not as strong, you're even at more risk, and that's important to, to realize. Um, so you have to be careful about answering the phone and certainly not giving away any personal information on the phone that you haven't initiated. So I brought up before that visual noise can be kind of too confusing. So as people have visual processing problems, it's not like they have problems seeing out of their eyes. It's more how your brain interprets all the stimuli. And so when there's a lot of stimuli, like on a month view calendar, that can be very overwhelming and hard to find the piece of information you're looking for. So you can benefit from using, like I said, a week or a day view um, sometimes when it's more severe, I recommend for people to use like a whiteboard where they just write the appointments or plans for the day so that the person can help rehearse themselves with that information if they have um, memory problems. Routine is very helpful and distractions can be very challenging, of course, for all of us. So talking about shifting a little more to other ways of supporting yourself beyond cognition, um, emotional support and wellness is very important. And we've all been through a rough year and a half. And um, for emotional wellness, I think counseling can be very helpful. There's individual therapy, but pastoral counseling if people have interest in spiritual connections and support groups for patients and caregivers. Um, and at this time, there's now much more um, access to telehealth, which um, is at home, it, you know, very um, efficient in terms of time. There's often reduced co-pays and fees. Um, and while you have to be able to use a computer, I would say there's not huge computer demands on how to do it. So if you have some skills, it can be very accessible. Other sources of support, um, I think, include meditation and mindfulness. If you've heard about these strategies, there's been research showing that they really help people increase their attention on the moment. Um, mindfulness is based on some non-judgment. So if you're having changes that you're struggling with, that can help you not judge yourself um, in coping with those and adjusting. Humor is a wonderful thing as well to help your mood. We all need some humor and personal time or personal treats, whatever that means for you. Um, and pets can be a great source of support too. Physically, I put these two pictures on here to kind of demonstrate. I think a lot of us, when the pandemic started, sat at home and watched the TV and it was quite stressful. Um, but sedentary lifestyle is definitely associated with a lot more um, issues physically, as well as I would say it impacts you emotionally. Um, but so you see that you can choose things like exercise and classes and different things that are engaging that help you um, stay more engaged and active and be very helpful. Your sleep is important. That's something that um, is very important. If you're having problems with sleep, that's something to follow up with your treating team about, as well as your diet and exercise. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about exercise. Um, we know that cardiovascular exercise is best for brain health from some research. 
Strength training is also helpful for um, mobility and balance, but you can do things like Tai Chi and yoga um, and other activities that are also helpful, maybe not as much in terms of your brain health, but they're good for your overall um, physical health. And you see people here in the photos on um, stationary bikes. That's often something that's a good tool to use um, if you have balance issues, using a stationary bike, you can get your heart rate up, but with limited risk of falling. And so that can be a good way to do that. Whereas walking would be hard to do quick enough to not fall and um, has some fall risk. And then you see the image of people doing some Chai Chi together there. Um, I did wanna share a little research with you that we see from trials that, um, combine aerobic exercise with strength training, to get the greatest benefits to attention and processing speeds. So you actually can improve your cognition just with exercise. So it seems like a real um, loss to not be doing that to help yourself. I know it's hard to motivate yourself for exercise, but that's an important thing to try to do. And aerobic exercise can also improve health, uh, cognition in healthy adults, and especially executive functions. So that's really an important area that could apply to people with conditions um, with neurodegenerative illness. I always tell patients though that, that the thing is effort is key. So if you're walking, it's probably hard to walk fast enough to get that great cardiovascular pumping that's gonna help your brain health. Um, so it's important to try to find ways um, that, that give you some good exercise. People with initiation difficulties often have trouble doing this. Um, it's hard to do it for anybody, but I think going to a class can be a commitment. Also, if you track it on your calendar, you're more likely to do it at a set time and be committed to that. And some people have told me just doing it with a partner has made them um, willing to do it. And they're always glad they did it afterwards, but it's hard to get started. I do have the, the wording on here, activity pacing, in that in all neurodegenerative conditions, a lot of people experience where um, some days you have good days and then you do too much and then you pay for it for several days. So I encourage people to take, um, to do activities, but to take good breaks and take good rest periods and try to pace themselves through the day so that you don't do a lot at one point and then sort of crash. So socially, it's important to connect with others and we've seen some real negative impacts of people being alone and not interacting with others in the past year and a half. Um, as it's safer to do so, it's good to do it in person if you can, but even remotely, um, virtually is good. And I encourage people to try new activities. And so you could volunteer. That would be a very structured way of interacting with other people if you're a little nervous around others. Um, but taking classes that you um, have never had time to do or trying something new can be good and new hobbies can connect you with other people. I did wanna share a little bit of data that we know loneliness is a risk factor for morbidity and mortality. And we found in a study of a sample over 5,000 people that sleep disturbance partially explained the relationship between loneliness and self-reported health. Um, and so that's a real, those are key things, loneliness and the sleep disturbance um, as well. Just to go back briefly to cognition, your brain really likes novelty. Um, the creative process can help us um, accept non-perfection. Sorry, that got cut off on the slide, but sort of a non-perfection. If we tended to be people who wanted something a certain way, you can be more free to try new things. I encourage people to try to do a new class or something they've never done and try a new hobby and not focus necessarily on if you're good at it, but just trying something new will be great exercise for your brain. Um, if you have trouble reading, reading is a wonderful exercise for your brain, but visually sometimes following the lines can be hard and people can use rulers and different guides to help them with that. But if that's too difficult, I encourage people to try books on tape. That's why I have the audio headset on there. Um, that people can be great storytellers and that can be a great way to focus your attention on a story and be engaged in something like that. But games are helpful. 
Um, there's nothing specific about crossword puzzles. If you've heard about that literature that said crossword puzzles help prevent um, more memory impairment, it's more uh, that any type of activity where you have to think and work your brain is what's going to help you. Um, you will notice if you do something over and over, like a game on your phone, you will get really good at it, but then it's important to shift to something new and you'll notice that you're slower and then get better at that one too. So there's lots of things to try there. As we kind of wrap up, I want to encourage you to think about your healthy choices. Um, you know, playing games with people, socializing, but also um, massage uh, has a role for, for just physical touch, laughter with old friends and connecting and your pets and ways you relax are important to think about. These strategies I'm talking about may seem small, but they actually can improve your quality of life um, and everyday functions and skills. It's not that necessarily we can say that using compensatory aids like calendars actually um, change the disease process, but they definitely can make you more able to manage your everyday life and be independent longer, which is a wonderful thing. And just remember that your brain likes novelty. So doing the same thing over and over is not great exercise. You wanna get some new stuff in there to, to be engaged. It's important, especially during these times of stress, to think about ordinary moments that bring you joy. Some people like to journal or articulate um, what they're grateful for every day, and that can help you focus on positive things and help build resilience. As you develop strategies, and you'll have, have these slides to review, I would encourage you to try just a few things at first and try different things. You know, so if if you go to an exercise class and you don't like it, try to think about what went wrong. Like, was it a, the wrong time of day for you? Was it too large? Um, was it the type of exercise or does it take some getting used to? Um, and then problem solve that. And you can try to make strategies part of your daily habit. Um, they call, I call it habit stacking. Like, so if you usually breakfast, you could try to play some cognitive games after breakfast or do stretching after breakfast or whatever it is so that you almost just pair that and it becomes part of your routine. And certainly if you're overwhelmed, focus on one problem at a time. You know, if you're trying to improve your sleep, it's probably hard to do a lot of things all at once. So maybe focus on one thing and then you can review these slides to get ideas about what, what your priority list is. So I wanna leave the session today with you having the sense that you can really improve your thinking skills and mood by doing various activities. And um, they can improve your quality of life, but also the, how well you can function on your own. And I would encourage you to think about your mind, body, and spirit. So think about um, your physical fitness of your body, what you're doing to, to help yourself physically, but also what you help with your, your body, uh, your mind in terms of cognition and strategies to help you do better with areas you have difficulty with, and your social spirit, your connection to others, your emotional sense of self. So um, I have my email up there and our website, and I'm glad this is I'm good on time. So we have lots of time for questions and I'm happy to answer and I appreciate your attention and I'm Glad I got to share all this with you today. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Lagerman. We really appreciate all of your insights today. We did have several questions come in along with some questions that were sent in through registration. So one question that we had come in was, how do we talk with someone who is in denial about their diagnosis? Yeah, that's a hard question. Um, you know, it's, I think it would be important to think about um, what they're sort of um, resisting. So I, in terms of, are they resisting the medical establishment on a whole, or are they concerned about um, what kind of impact it would have? Um, it's important to kind of have some personal relationship with the person um, to tell, I would say, to describe kind of your concerns, but also say, how can we work on this that feels comfortable for you? Um, another thing I often share with people is, you know, it's good to get second opinions. And when you go to a doctor or start something new in terms of a treatment, um, I think it's good 
to say, well, we're going to go and find out what there is and what they offer, but that you're not necessarily um, agreeing to do a lot of things all at once, that you're going to kind of do an information gathering session when you meet with doctors and see what's next, but that they still maintain control of how to make a decision of what's next. If that's part of their concern, that can help them feel like they can choose, you know, how quickly to take on more information and what to do next. But it is good to think about what sort of, what is their hesitancy, hesitancy and what's their struggle. Um, so you can at least try to tailor your um, um, support to them for the area that they're having the hardest time with. So. Great, thank you. Um, now this next question is a little bit sensitive in nature, but it is something that we have gotten this question in you know, a couple of times before, so I think it's important to address it. Uh, how do you deal with a patient's suicidal ideation? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I, I, am, I ask every patient I meet about the suicidal thoughts, um, and I think that's an important thing to assess. Uh, but to have the time to do that. So um, I think what I do is ask if they're having suicidal thoughts or feelings and then ask them to tell me what they are. People have lots of different types of, of thoughts. And the thing is to really, um, I say for, for me as a clinician is I don't react in terms of is that bad or good, but be asking lots of questions so I understand where the person is coming from. I do differentiate clinically from, we probably all at times experience thoughts of what the end of our life will be like or what dying will be like, but that's quite different from a, a very active desire to die. And so one of the things we assess for is, do you have thoughts about it? And then, you know, have you made more decisions about what you would do? First of all, so then making a plan. People are making a plan and making certain decisions to prepare for this. That's a much more serious um, level of suicidal thoughts. And we would want particularly them to be talking, hopefully, with a clinician, but getting help to assess um, what's really behind that. Most people who are becoming more suicidal feel hopeless about something, and that's driving them to want to escape. Um, I think when people have just a general sense of, you know, I think about what it'll be like to die or I want to die sometime, but it's not specific. It's often um, due to that sense of having an out or a, a way to cope with something. Um, but when those thoughts get more serious, it can really be that there's a challenge with they don't have hope in their everyday life or they're struggling to see how they're going to move forward. And that's an important conversation to have with a clinician um, and get help as needed, whether it's therapy and medicines or more discussions with family members and um, support systems. But it is something I, I don't encourage people to ask about it if they don't have the time to really give it um, due diligence to find out what's going on with the person because it's a... Um, Everybody can have different thoughts about it, and it's something to really explore to find out what they need. Thank you. That was an excellent, excellent answer for our audience. Question is: How does one deal with patients who do not want to socialize due to their progression? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a hard one because we know, especially from this past year and a half, that if we don't socialize. We actually have uh, declines physically as well as cognitively and emotionally. So it's, it's very uh, harmful to us. You know, I would try to talk to them about what types of activities feel comfortable to them. They may be quite overwhelmed with a large um, class or group of people. And so going to an exercise class with 30 people may just be too much, but saying, you know, can you work one-on-one -on -one with a PT at home uh, two times a week or a personal trainer, is that more comfortable? Um, is it the volume of people? Is it the activity? And if it's being seen in terms of your physical limitations or changes, you know, I would encourage them to try to go to some support groups. Um, I always caution people when you go to support groups, you're going to see all types of functioning. Some people may be in wheelchairs, some people may have minimal changes. 
and not to take any personal assessment of this is going to be me. You can't know all their physical health and what else is going on with people, but more to, to gain acceptance that we all have different ranges of issues and it's important for us to talk and learn from each other, but also support each other in this journey. And that can be a, a safer environment in that, um, like for instance, if you have some unusual movements, people there tend to know that those things happen and you don't get as much reaction as let's say you do if you're in public at a grocery store or somewhere and you think people are staring at you. So I would try to find ways that seem more comfortable um, and it doesn't need to be high volume of social interaction, it's more quality that's important. So you know, if you just have a few people you socialize with but you're very close to, that can serve a good function for you. Thank you. Our next question is, how to convince others in the family, including the patient, to participate in care and planning for the future? Okay, that's, that's a big one. Um, in families, um, people differ in their comfort with this. I mean, some people will be in denial, some people will be more open but clueless, and some people will be much more interested and engaged. And then some people are actually kind of overdriven and want to manage everything, but maybe in a way that's challenging. Um, so I think it's important um, to talk with family and see kind of what everyone's awareness is and what their comfort level is. Um, some people may be much more slower to kind of um, take information in and um, acknowledge it. Um, that can be the case for children of parents, you know, that are, the roles are shifting. Sometimes that can be a challenge. Um, but I would encourage people to try to have conversations with that. Sometimes having a medical physician or a psychologist or someone be the person who is driving or organizing that conversation can be helpful because you have then a person not in the family system who's helping kind of move it forward. Um, we do that a lot at our clinic, and I think that can be very helpful so that, you know, if there's some personal conflict within the family, being in front of a provider, usually everyone is more engaged on the topic, but you can also kind of direct how that conversation can go a bit better. Um, it, it is a situation, though, where some people will opt out and just will not want to do anything, um, but I do think it's important for people in the family who are willing to, to kind of keep moving forward and they can at least maybe share kind of updates written or by email. And if someone doesn't respond, that's their kind of uh, response, but you kind of keep moving forward with what are the plans. Um, I always tell people, and I sort of encourage that with family members when I'm talking to them is it's painful to have conversations about some challenging things, but it's a lot better to have some sense of having personal choice and what's important to you and expressing that um, versus having something happen and then reacting to it in a very urgent crisis way. And that can feel very stressful to everybody. But I think having more that element of control and ability to articulate what the wishes or plans are and what's feasible within the family system um, can be a much healthier way, even though it is challenging at times. Thank you for that. Another question is, how can a caregiver help a patient pass away with a sense of dignity? Mm -hmm. um, I, I read a book recently, um, it was a while ago, but it's um, called Being Mortal. And it talks about, you know, as in our profession, our physician lives, we don't ask people what's important to them. And I think, um, getting involved with palliative care or some type of um, hospice or palliative care team, those providers can be particularly comfortable with navigating the questions of what matters to you? You know, what do you want to have happen in the last few years of your life? Um, what's the most important thing to you? You know, is it to be able to see your grandchildren or is it to go somewhere or is it to be at home in the comfort of your home? what that is for the person, but then also helping that reality then become for them. Um, 
But I think if it's hard for the family members to do that, I would encourage you to, to ask to get involved with a team that can help you with that. Sometimes what we think is important to somebody is not the driving thing for them. And um, it's important, I think, to ask people what they would want and what they feel um, is meaningful for them. As we can lose functions, we actually can adapt. And so someone may not find being fed to be difficult at all, but they want to be able to do something else independently. So you really have to just ask them what, what it is to them that bothers them or what it is to them that's their primary goal and how they want that to be handled. Um, but I think just having those conversations can help people articulate what it is that's so um, important to them. And just having that conversation, then you feel empowered that you can create that reality for yourself and what matters to you in the last period of your life. Thank you so much. And so we have time for just one last question. And mm -hmm. it is, um, when do you know that a person is doing too much? Often my family members tell me that they don't really know how to tell when they're really tired from when they're too tired. Hmm. Um, you know, it, I can't tell from the question if this is about a person with the neurodegenerative disease or not, but I'm going to say in general, we often exhibit behaviors when we're exhausted or too tired. And those can be pronounced for someone with the disorder. So in a caregiver, they could exist too, but they may be more pronounced with someone with an illness. Um, some of the things I'm thinking about are, you know, you may get more irritable, you may get more um, unable to make decisions, uh, you may um, be more, um, we talked about inhib disinhibition, you may be more expressive of um, anger or cursing. And so I think you need to look at behavioral changes. And when someone seems kind of out of their normal range, you look at the behavior and it helps you determine what is going on with that person. A lot of times people get where they can't say they're hungry or tired or thirsty. But as a caregiver, I think it's important to be looking at the behaviors and then trying to see if you can determine or even ask, is it we need to take a break and get food right now or we need a time out and just relax for a bit. We've been doing too much and what is going on. Um, but a person with the d disorders may have a hard time having the self-awareness of what's going on with them. Um, if you look over time at patterns, you can often kind of see, because that's something we notice is people get very fatigued in the afternoon. So you would want to try to have doctor appointments in the morning and then rest time at home. Some people you know, by three or four just are not functioning well. And that might be they need to take a nap and have quiet time. Um, so looking at patterns and what's happening and what behaviors are happening, I think can guide people um, to what changes they may, may, may need to make. There's actually, I sorry, I didn't put it in my slides, but all right. Thank you so much, Dr. Legaman. We really appreciate all of your insights for today's presentation. Now we're going to be heading into our lunch break until 12.45 p.m. Um, before you go, we just want to remind everybody that all of our presentations today will be available post a conference. They are going to be edited and cleaned up for you in the next few weeks. We will be sure to email those out to you. And in the meantime, we do have the slides and handouts available in a Dropbox link that if you scroll down, you will see a resources section on this event site. And we hope to see you back in half an hour. Enjoy your lunch break.